ask uh, um, to speak about sustainability and uh, what a big word is sustainability. Uh, there is so many theories, uh, so many opinions, so many debates uh, on sustainability. There is huge uh, entire um, university departments dealing with that. There is uh, um, uh, scientific journals and so on. So I decided to start with something that in appearance is much more simple. I will speak about apples. Swiss people love apples. The apple is so... Ah, oh, thank you. I forgot to go to the market this morning. What a beautiful individual. Okay, I'm placing it here. The apple even plays a central role in the Swiss foundation myth. When 710 years ago, back in 1307, a guy uh, called William Tell, uh, a freedom fighter, and later he became a national hero, placed an apple on him, had to place an apple on his son's water head and shoot it with a crossbow to redeem himself from a death penalty he was facing because he didn't respect, uh, he was disrespectful to the Habsburg um, dominator of the world. But what happened ever since? This, on, the, on, the, on this side here, you see uh, a traditional agricultural landscape of Switzerland in the 1950s. In, uh, back then, uh, Switzerland was just a huge big orchard, basically, around our villages. In, uh, by, two, by the year 2000, the same village looked like this. So we had a huge decline in our um, tree populations. Uh, these orchards, they are all uh, tall stem, high trunk uh, fruit trees. Most of them are apples, but there is uh, air, plums, uh, cherries, and so on. And uh, the, the initial force for the decrease of these, apple, uh, of these uh, trees was the National Alcohol Authority. Because the farmers, they were making too much, sorry, they were making too much uh, rakia at that time. <laughs> and there was an alcohol problem. So the Swiss government subsidized the felling of those trees. And so within a few decades, we passed from 15.3 uh, million uh, tall trunk trees in our landscape to about 2 million in, in just a few decades. Later on, agricultural re uh, revolution came, um, the new varieties, whatever, uh, industrialized uh, uh, production methods, and the, the the patrimony decreased even further. This is our landscape. I am from the southern part of uh, Switzerland. It's called the, the, the oblast, the canton is called Ticino. We are the minority speaking Italian. And in our area, we have the same, uh, the same phenomenon. And uh, basically, uh, what happened is uh, urbanization took over. The landscapes, uh, they were abandoned, agriculture was abandoned. And it had, it has been, there has been a huge um, uh, uh, urban development, and the, you see up here also, the forest has increased. So what happened, basically, the city grew to the margin of the forests, the forest grew, and the traditional uh, agricultural landscape basically disappeared. And with them, uh, also our beautiful landscapes. This was the situation we were facing in uh, uh, 2005, when we started this project, uh, project I'm going to tell you about, this is the area of Tesserete. Tesserete is 10 kilometers north of Lugano, the city, uh, the, the main city in, uh, in uh, southern Switzerland, in Italian-speaking Switzerland, and it's a place where um, apple production and, and uh, those orchards had a long tradition. And basically, our uh, local his, uh, regional heritage was in danger. And uh, with it, those beautiful landscapes and those agricultural ecosystems. Um, at the same time, we were facing a huge um, loss of genetic diversity. We calculate now that in the world there may be around 20,000 different <coughs> varieties. Today, in Switzerland, in the conservatories, in the collections, we conserve about 1,400 different apple varieties. In our shops, in our markets, we will find about three or four 
different apple varieties. And they all look almost the same. They have a standardized shape, they have standardized ergonomic uh, traits, they are, uh, have a similar taste, and they're all very uh, inbred, actually. They're genetically very, very uh, similar among the same. But imagine, back in the 50s, when we still had, um, when we still had 13.5 million apple trees, how many varieties we had. So we really lost many, many of those uh, traditional uh, apple varieties and we did the genetic diversity. But why? What was the thing that produced all this diversity? The apple is one of the most diversified fruit trees because of its um, extreme versatility. It was used for many, many different purposes. You can, uh, you can harvest the first apples in June that you eat fresh, and the last ones in November, that you will keep conserved until the next summer without, without the refrigeration. Apples are extremely easy to conserve. They had so many different uses also to produce spirits, to produce juices, to um, consume fresh, dried, and even as fodder. Apple trees used to be planted as tutors for supporting grape wine or as marks to uh, mark the limits of properties. And with this genetic diversity, or with the disappearance of those orchards, also the associated species diversity declined. We have many, many uh, species that are closely linked to those traditional agricultural systems. Here we have uh, birds, particularly. We have the, the red start and the rhinek, but also the hunku or the little owl. These are all birds that are on priority lists for conservation in Switzerland because they became so rare that they are on the fringe of extinction. Some of you probably know them. In Bulgaria, those birds are still quite frequent. You still see them in your backyard. But you know, we didn't want to have to take a flight to Bulgaria every time when we wanted to see those birds. We want to see them in our backyards too. And we want to give the opportunity to our children and our grandchildren to see those birds too. And so with the landscape, the agricultural ecosystem that disappeared, the genetic diversity that disappears, and the species diversity that disappears. We have the three components of biodiversity, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. And that was our problem. The problem we were facing, and we wanted to do something against this. So what we did? We had the, 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 the it was a lucky situation, actually, because in this uh, valley, the Capriasca Valley, the, uh, we had the three people, we were friends, and we were all interested by this subject, so we gathered together and we started to be, we decided that we wanted to do something against this problem. So there's Fulvio there, he's a master gardener. There's Muriel here, she's an ethnobotanist. There is uh, Elia here, he's an agronomist. Paolo is a forestry engineer. Sophie, she's a landscape architect, and myself, I'm a botanist. At that time, we were still smiling because we didn't know what was going to come up next. <laughs> and I've learned a very important thing at that time, that it is better to have a bunch of friends that know how to work together and that are good professionals in their field, but completely chaotically organized. And they didn't have, we didn't have a clue how to do it really. Then, a very well-structured project with the wrong people. So my message is always, it's better to have the right people and the wrong project than to have the wrong project, the right project and the wrong people. So what we did, we, we joined into a, an NGO, uh, an association, a local association, which is called Capriasca Ambiente. This association was founded to fight against a, a development project. It was a, a golf course 10 years earlier. It was successful, the golf course that was being placed in those beautiful orchards that there were left over was never built. And the association lost its purpose, in fact. It lost its uh, reason of existing. So we converted it into an apple conservation 
organization. We were also quite lucky because at that time, in 2005, the Swiss Federal Office for uh, Agriculture made a call for proposals to uh, NGOs in Switzerland that were dealing with the conservation of genetic resources in crop plants. This was a consequence of the signing of the Treaty of the International Treaty on uh, Plant Genetic Resources for Agriculture and Food, which, as a, a pre, uh, an important proponent, uh, foresaw the fact that within the, the, the states, um, the state administrations should finance programs to conserve uh, genetic diversity in crop plants, that is, traditional varieties. This treaty is a consequence of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is a result of this very famous Rio Summit in 1992. And there are three conventions that came out from Rio, which is the Convention on Biodiversity, on Desertification, and on Climate Change. So we are really in the right frame at that time. And we were also lucky because we had no competitors in Ticino. Nobody had ever done something like that. But we had no experience. We had just nice professional curricula, and we were motivated. So the first project was about um, recuperating those old varieties. So we started mapping trees. We went around the countryside. We mapped those old trees. And we were taking coordinates. We were taking uh, any information that was associated with those uh, old trees, whatever uh, the property, uh, if there was some information about varieties, health status, vitality of the tree, phytosanitary status, and so on and so forth. What you see here, what this guy is doing, is taking a little branch that you need, it's called a scion, that you need to reproduce your apple. You cannot plant, if you plant the apple seeds of this one, the seeds of this one, you will get, probably, a small yellow apple like this, that tastes like salad or cucumber. Right? Because of genetic uh, recombination, every time you have sexual reproduction, the seed is the product of sexual uh, reproduction, you have genetic recombination, and uh, your genetic um, uh, uh, setup of the individual that is going to come is not the same. So if you want to conserve a apple variety, and it's the same for pears, for plums, for berries, and for many other trees, you have to reproduce them vegetatively. You have to graft them with rootstocks. And that's what he's doing here. And you do this job in winter. What he then what he did next, he started to recover the historical knowledge around those fruits. And this is quite a big um, and difficult thing because most of the people were died. Uh, an apple tree or a pear tree lives for an apple tree lives for hundred years maybe, a pear tree for 300 years, and you find those old trees, but the person who planted it and knows about the tree has disappeared already. So we were running around the Chino to do interviews with those old farmers. We were going to um, libraries, to museums, to uh, archives. By the way, this is a, a museum that is in Torino. It's, the, uh, it's called the Museo della Frutta. It's really, really worth going. They're all false. Um, <coughs> They're all false fruits, they are uh, models, and they have thousands and thousands of different varieties, and they really look as if they were real. That was done by agronomist professors in, uh, in the early 19th century. Our aim was to identify the varieties we had in our region, in our Capriasca Valley. So we had so many unknown apples, and we started exchanging them, and we started going to homologic uh, exhibitions. The homology, by the way, is the science, it's the discipline of botany that studies uh, fruit trees. A homologist is even rarer than a bird, than the birds I showed you before. In Switzerland, there's only about five or six homologists left. But what is interesting is that there is a network all over Europe of people who know those ancient fruits. And so you exchange contacts, you exchange knowledge. We are in contact with people from Romania, from Italy, from France, from Germany, and from, from all over the Europe. And you, basically you send around pictures of apples, or you send around pictures, you meet and you exchange apples with them. <laughs> so, the, um, at the end we started to 
be the living collection that we wanted to use to reproduce those trees. And nowadays we have about 250 different other varieties in our collections and about 50 different uh, air varieties. So uh, many of those uh, varieties are unique. They're, we did genetic studies also. There is a part of those varieties that are the classical uh, widespread uh, fruit varieties, but most of them they are local genotypes that only exist there. So why is the scope of this? What is the scope of this? It's, it's really the conservation of the genetic resources for the future. Switzerland is, had a very utilitaristic program. The idea is we are facing global change, climate change. We will have new challenges, uh, world population increasing, new pests and diseases emerging, and agricultural and, and, and agriculture that wants to be more sustainable, less. Um, dependent on pesticides and fertilizers and so on. And so in these old varieties you have the resistance genes, you have uh, the drought resistance genes, you have um, the genetic material that can be used in the future to breed new varieties that are um, adapted to respond to those new challenges. I priori I, a priori you cannot know which is the variety that is useful. So you have to conserve them all, or the most of them. And afterwards, when you do the studies, you will find which one is the one that is going to be useful to meet the future ch uh, challenge. And this is actually the case. Now we already have one uh, apple varieties that has been put on the market that is originating from an ancient tree. Not from our collection, but from our colleagues in the northern part of Switzerland. What we did also was involving society in this small Cabriasca Valley. It was essential to uh, show people what we were doing and uh, to uh, involve them. And we did that by creating a uh, local festival. It actually is on right now, in this weekend. I've never skipped the event. I just skipped it this time to come here to speak about it. So it's a weekend that is dedicated to those uh, ancient uh, apple varieties, to the orchards and to the biodiversity associated with it. And it's now in its 12th edition. Every time, every uh, time we have about 500 to 2,000 people coming there. And this really created a, a momentum around these traditional orchards in our region. We also do, we have done hundreds of didactic activities with schools, with children. They come and they plant the tree. Every time we plant trees, for instance, in our orchards, we do that with uh, the classes, the school classes. Right? And that has, a, uh, had a, has had a very interesting outcome, which was the fact that we don't face any vandalism in our uh, collections. You know, a small tree is something very fragile, and it's building up, and if you break it, you will never have a healthy tree in the end. The first few years are essential, and it's very easy that somebody comes and whatever will takes a, a branch or wants to destroy something. But as the population was involved and there was an ownership built around these projects, we never, even if you, you are in a place where many people live, where there's people going through, we never had um, vandalism. The project became really sustainable then when we started to do a cider press. We, start, we, we found some money, or we had to gather some money to buy a, a, a press where we can produce apple juice, where people can bring their own apples, and we guarantee that what they take back is uh, fruit juice uh, pasteurized in bitter boxes, what we take back is the juice of their own apples, it's certified. There's no admixture, they can bring whatever quantity between 50 kilos and 500 kilos, and they go back with their own apple juice. And this is done, and we had to do it that way, because we didn't have any other uh, option. It is done in a protected farm, which is a social enterprise, where uh, people with disabilities work. And the fact that they were there from Monday 7 till Friday 5 p.m. was the possibility to um, do this activity there because people can bring their apples whenever they come around. They don't have to take um, appointments. They bring their apples and they are sure that the next Saturday morning they can come and collect their fruit juices. And the interesting thing here is that this activity ended up making profit. It was not really our aim to, do, to be profitable. Our aim was more to cover the costs 
Uh, and within nine years, we basically had a, a net profit of 43,000 Swiss francs. That's about uh, 70,000 leva. And our, um, our investment costs for the machine of 32,000 Swiss francs was amortized within the first seven years. Industry never does that, but they usually have longer time for their machines. That this machine can last for 20, 30, 40 years without uh, much maintenance. So what we are doing, we are making profit, that we can use this money for further activities of this kind. So it was not our job to, do, um, to become apple juice producers. We wanted to protect the trees. We wanted to give a meaning to those old apple trees that were still left in the, in the landscape. One of the, those trees, they, they, they were not used, nobody was using the product. The pro they were actually disturbing when you have to cut your grass so and you have a tree in the middle, you have to turn around. And it's a bit annoying, it's a bit disturbing, so they were cutting them even further. But what happened is that we were really successful. We had um, a um, multiplier effect. People started to invest their own money to recover ancient apple trees that were producing uh, fruits, that were transformed into juices, because they wanted the good, uh, the good apple juice. They started to manage their uh, orchards again. And by the way, those juices, they're completely organic. They are completely socially responsible. They are totally fair trade. And we, we pay in our, in our activity, we pay rent, insurance, uh, social, uh, social um, uh, fees, uh, we pay salaries, and, and, the, and the, the, the whole world is done in complete dignity and uh, respect all laws, we have all certifications for, uh, to be able to do this job, but we don't need labeling because we have built this trust, people believe it, people know how the activity is done, they know exactly where the apple tree was and how the process is done. So we save a lot of money on, on certifications, we don't need to have uh, organic certifications and so on. People started managing their orchards again. There is a growing interest in all varieties. They start buying the trees from us. We work with nurseries to reproduce them. They um, start, they are interested in the product, in the, in the history of the place. We created a job in Ignobotany, and Ignobotanist that is working 100% on this thing in a peripheric area of Switzerland, which is Ticino, and in a peripheric area of Ticino, which is Capriazka. And you know, I know, I don't know, 10 professional ethnobotanists in Switzerland, they all work in Zurich and in Berlin. There's no one working in the big cities, there's no one working in, in the small areas. And we provided part time work for four or five people, five, six people, between when the apple season is on, between uh, October, between September and November. We can subcontract work to nurseries, to biologists, to graphic designers, so we created a little economy around that. And it was our goal. Our goal was that people started to do this again. And the, 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 the key element was it basically this, uh, this press, this side of press. So the project ended up being sustainable. Our idea was never, we, we didn't come from the theory, we didn't want to be uh, sustainable in the first place. We just wanted to protect the environment. That was our goal. But we ended up doing it in a way that it became sustainable. It's so sustainable that I don't have to work on this, on this project anymore. I'm uh, like an honorary uh, member of the association. And, and uh, uh, what we did is we, we have an economical activity that generates profits, that pays all its costs. That is, that is embedded in a, a social system where everybody has a role, even um, according to the potential and in full dignity of every single person. And this, by generating a landscape or maintaining and generating a landscape, by not depleting resources, by actually creating uh, natural uh, resources. So in other words, we have a business that makes money, that is respectful that doesn't abuse of labor and that creates biodiversity. And this is sustainable, so, uh, sustainability in, in my eyes. So, I finish here. Things cannot be done alone. There's many people involved. And I want to thank the organizers 
uh, Smart Foundation and, and all the very enthusiastic and nice people I met here. And especially also uh, Leonardo Angelucci, who is the graphic designer, who helped me on a voluntary basis to do this, this project.